Meanwhile, House Budget Committee Chairman Democrat John Yarmuth is requesting a CBO report on various proposals to establish a single-payer health care system in the U.S. This, of course, would be a major first step toward Medicare for all or socialized medicine. So how would they pay for it? Yarmuth told Neil Cavuto earlier today that higher taxes would do the trick. Take a listen. What we're going to do in the hearing is explore the options that are available to the country to expand health care to everybody through a Medicare-like program, consider the, the varieties of how we could do that and what the impact on the budget would be. Well, Our what are the ways that you would pay for it, sir, just so I understand? I know you yeah. had espoused raising the corporate tax rate from the 21 percent was lowered to, to 28 percent. Would that be one way to pay for that or, or what? Well, I think that would be a possibility. Hmm. Well, for more on this, let's bring in the former CBO director who knows a thing or two about CBO reports, Douglas Holtz Eakin. You know, Doug, increasing the corporate rate uh, to the extent that they're saying wouldn't begin to pay for that. I mean, this is, meta this is Obamacare on steroids. Would a CBO report reflect that? Uh, CBO is going to, to give them a very, very straightforward reading of the cost of their proposal. And I think that's the important thing here. So far in this debate, we've had a lot of great names, single payers, Medicare for all, Medicaid buy-in, Medicare buy-in, Medicare plus X. No one's had a proposal. Like, what does that mean? And if you look underneath the hood, it's ranged everything from a little expansion of Obamacare to takeover of the entire health care system like the British National Health Service. So. Uh, I, I think what's interesting about this is for the first time, somebody's going to have to write it down and say, this is what we are going to do so that the CBO can give them back the answer, how much will it cost? But I'm with you. If they do anything on the scale of the rhetoric, $800 billion, which is about what they get out of that corporate tax increase, isn't going to come close to filling the bill. Well, well Doug, uh, Jack Howell from Barron's here. We're talking, yeah. about the, we're talking about federal spending here, but don't we, in <clears throat> fairness, have to also include in America, the money that people pay for their health care premium, the money they're paying out of their pockets, they're paying taxes, they're paying three ways for health care. When you look at other countries that have a universal health care system, they're paying one way. We're spending 20 percent of GDP on health care here. Other rich nations are spending half that and getting better health outcomes. So, yeah, we're going to get sticker shock when we look at just the federal budget. But aren't we going to save sure. when it comes to premiums and out of pockets? Um, I, I don't see any real reason why you'll save dramatically. I mean, the, in the end, the national health care bill is what it is, 20 percent of GDP. And most of these proposals are different ways to rearrange that bill. Instead of having private insurance transferred from one person to another, use the federal government to take the money from someplace to pay someone's bill. It's the underlying cost. It's the issue. So a second way to think about these proposals is what problem are they trying to solve? Is it about coverage? in which case you just write checks, very big checks, or are you going to try to change the cost of care? And if you are, how does the proposal actually do it? And things have been very thin on that front so far. Uh, Doug, uh, Steve Doug. Forbes here. Uh, one of the things hey, that uh, happens when you have a single-payer system, of course, is you destroy medical research. You look at Europe, once a font sure. of great medical innovations. Uh, can CBO factor that in a way that mm -hmm. we're going to have uh, less good health care and less of it in the future with a single-payer system than uh, what we have today? Uh, they certainly can. Um, I think there are a couple of things that CBO is going to recognize right away that are hard to quantify. I mean, number one, you have your point, which is we have the finest medical science. You might not think we have the finest health care system, but we certainly have the finest medical science. And that's not an automatic uh, birthright. Germany used to have the finest medical science, and they lost it because of the nature of their health care system. So I'd worry about that a lot. The second thing is, if you take something that is done in the private sector, say employer-sponsored insurance, and you suddenly move it onto the federal budget, you have to levy the taxes to, to cover that bill, and the taxes are in and of themselves damaging. It is not damaging for an employer and employee to figure out how to compensate uh, for work. It is damaging to involuntarily take money from the private sector and distort incentives. So I worry a lot about those impacts over the long term. Doug, it's Carol Roth. Let's talk about the execution piece here. We currently have a government that is shut down yep. over $5 billion. We have a government that does not run <laughs> anything well outside of perhaps the military, and we know that there's even a lot of waste in the military. So even if we could find this fantasy money somewhere to pay for it, the reality is, why does anybody think that our federal government could actually execute <clears throat> this for 300 million-plus people? I think that's a really good point. If you rolled the clock back, say, five, ten years, 
Uh, a lot of folks on the left were saying, hey, I don't understand why these conservatives hate the idea of single payer. We have a VA system that's fantastic. It delivers <laughs> high quality care to these, these deserving. Right. What do we think about that now? That doesn't look so good anymore. So I, I'm with you. I think there's a real issue here in execution. We have a reliance on private sector entities, whether they're hospitals, medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, to, to actually deliver the care. And if you nationalize that, I think you're, you're really creating a big problem. Yeah, another, another problem along VA lines is Native Americans. The health care system for them is an atrocity as well. Yeah. Douglas, this is uh, Gary Kaltbaum. I have a rule of thumb with government. When they tell you a billion, it's two. When they tell you it's two, it's four. And we're hearing estimates of $32 trillion over 10 yeah. years. And my rusty abacus says that if we do this, <laughs> uh, from dollar one, we'll be taxed up to 75, 80 percent, which will kill the economy and destroy everything in its wake. What are you guys prepared to do as far as messaging about what I consider to be about as big a nonsense as I've seen in a very long time? Well, when the first Medicare for All proposal came out, it was uh, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders during the, the previous presidential election. And, um, you know, we, we did analysis of that proposal and we came up with numbers that are in that $30 trillion uh, range. And at that point, that was enough sticker shock that, that the, really I think the, the debate dropped off. I think now, to, to my surprise, that's not scaring people on the left. They think, oh, fine, so it's, it's expensive, it's go big or go home time. And uh, so you need to look inside that and start asking questions like, well, do you understand that in that proposal as written down in law, it would be illegal to own private insurance? Hey, where are the well, competing I don't think ideas Americans on this? are prepared to do that. Where are the competing ideas on this from Republicans, though? All I hear is that you know, Democrats are going to spend too much money on health care. But I sure. look at the rest of the world. We're spending so much more than everyone else already. We can't just stick with what we're doing. So where are the competing? Who has the best competing idea out there that you've seen? I think a fair criticism of Republicans is that they have failed to develop a consensus proposal that they can support. We saw that when they tried the repeal and replace in 2017, the House had done its homework. It passed something out. And uh, whatever, whether you liked it or not, they had gotten to a point where they could yeah. get the votes and get it out of the House. But the Senate never landed on a proposal. They never got something well, out of the Senate. Well, they had a chance to vote died. for it, Doug, That's but there was criticism. one vote that, uh, that came in. No, we but, know who that came from, and that, I, that changed I, history. But we, I, know a lot, okay. I know a lot about that vote, and that's not a fair characterization. There was no proposal. That was a vote to go to a conference and maybe come up with a proposal. Okay. There, the All problem right. has been they never get to consensus. But they again, they did, they did have their time, and, and unfortunately, the Republicans didn't do it when they had both the House and the Senate. Doug, I agree. we thank you very much. Great stuff, Doug. I really appreciate it. Please thank come you. back and see us again. Appreciate it.